Welcome to the Tim Booker channel, where wisdom deserves to be spread. Wishing you a delightful listening experience. In this episode, I'll be decoding for you, Flow, the Psychology of Optimal Experience. This is the pioneering work on the theory of flow by the world-renowned figure in positive psychology, Mihai Csikszentmihalyi. So, what's the significance of understanding flow? It's possible to notice that modern individuals often find themselves in two states of unhappiness. They either feel bored due to the monotony of life or anxious because of excessive stress. The theory of flow can precisely counter these unhappy experiences, as Mihai discovered that concentration can bring about a sense of happiness. This book comprises 200,000 words, and I'll spend approximately 25 minutes sharing its core insights with you. Flow can bring us a positive life experience, infusing us with a continuous stream of mental energy to enhance our quality of life. The concept of flow refers to a state where people are fully engrossed in an activity, experiencing immersive engagement. The English term for it is, flow, signifying a sense of fluid motion. Imagine it representing the psychological sensation akin to a watercourse's natural flow. It's like an unseen current beneath the sea, where maintaining focus allows the current to carry you as you explore the depths. Mihai observed that many top artists, athletes, writers, and presenters experience this phenomenon. You've likely had experiences of flow as well. For instance, when painting, playing chess, or engaging in online gaming, you might forget time, meals, and even restroom breaks, a clear indication of being in a state of flow. Starting from the 1960s and 1970s, Mihai has been studying positive psychological experiences in humans. He has conducted extensive and influential research, making him one of the foremost authorities in the field. By the late 20th century, Mihai, along with psychologist Martin Seligman and others, initiated the positive psychology movement, which shifted focus from studying the negative aspects of human psychology to exploring the positive aspects with the goal of promoting human happiness and development. As a pivotal figure and initiator of this movement, Mihai's most significant contribution lies in introducing the concept of flow. Although similar concepts existed in Buddhism and Taoism, they were often esoteric and difficult for ordinary individuals to apply. Mihai's innovation lies in his clear and precise description of the psychological experiences associated with flow. He distilled the core elements of the flow experience and systematically outlined the prerequisites for achieving it. Moreover, Mihai employed rigorous scientific methods to study flow, such as the experience sampling method, which involved recording individuals' flow experiences in their daily lives. Gathering such data required substantial time and effort, and over several decades, Mihai's team accumulated valuable data. Consequently, Mihai elevated humanity's understanding of the flow phenomenon beyond casual observation, entering the realm of scientific study. In this audio segment, we'll explore the theory of flow from three perspectives. Firstly, we'll delve into what kind of individuals can attain the state of happiness. Only those who learn to control their consciousness can determine their life experiences and achieve happiness. Secondly, we'll discuss how to regulate consciousness, as optimal experiences can counter mental disorder and maintain ordered awareness. Lastly, we'll examine the conditions necessary for optimal experiences or flow to manifest. Let's start by examining the first viewpoint. Only those who learn to control their consciousness can determine their own life experiences and thus reach the realm of happiness. Our focus on enhancing the quality of life centers on experiences. Experience pertains to how individuals perceive life. It's a purely subjective feeling. Whether you're a genius or an ordinary person, it's entirely about you. Yet, this experience also represents your most genuine feelings. The joy we derive from life ultimately depends on how our minds filter and process daily experiences. Every person has experiences each day. Happiness serves as an indicator of the quality of these experiences. If people's life experiences aren't positive, a sense of happiness naturally eludes them. So, let's delve into the root causes of human unhappiness. In other words, why do people feel their experiences are negative? Zooming out, at the universe's inception, it wasn't concerned with human comfort. From an evolutionary perspective, our ancestors were like other organisms. Surviving on this crisis-prone earth required avoiding floods and predators, while constantly contending with viruses and microorganisms. Mihai intriguingly compares human and animal consciousness. Both functioned under adverse conditions, yet animals acted driven solely by instinct. 
They wouldn't ponder irrelevant information, for instance, a hungry lion focuses solely on prey. A lion that's eaten lies basking in the sun, its attention concentrated on the warmth. It hasn't evolved to experience dejection or despair. Without external threats, animals find contentment in their own world. You see, animals that invite trouble upon themselves are only humans. This is due to humans' highly developed nervous systems. Although sensitivity aids human survival, it also makes human minds challenging to manage. While humans control the external environment for survival, this doesn't reduce the chaos the world presents us. In essence, the physiological mechanisms shaped by natural selection merely serve the purposes of survival and reproduction, lacking the function of increasing happiness. Of course, nature isn't a heartless tyrant. Throughout evolution, humans still found opportunities for pleasure, primarily sensory enjoyment. Tasting delicious food and wine, relaxing after a satisfying meal, experiencing sexual pleasure, all fall under this category. Some believe that pleasure equates to happiness. Mihai sees this as a misinterpretation of happiness. He clearly perceives that the pursuit of pleasure is essentially a genetic reward mechanism for species propagation. For instance, the pleasure of enjoying food is meant to replenish energy for survival. When a man is attracted to a beautiful woman and relishes the joys of relationships, it's actually his genes orchestrating this to encourage reproduction and offspring. In this stimulus-response behavioral pattern, enjoying pleasure isn't wrong. However, such fleeting joy doesn't contribute to lasting happiness. Those engulfed in it are essentially led by bodily desires, unable to resist genetic prompts when necessary. How can this be considered a conscious choice of life experience? Now, let's consider the root causes of human unhappiness from a sociological perspective. In the face of the vast universe, humans remain insignificant. This sense of powerlessness is evident in numerous ancient myths and religions. Whether it's Eskimo people, Amazon basin hunters, Native Americans, Australian aborigines, or China's early inhabitants, myths were constructed to establish an ordered world where humanity resided at the universe's center. Such cultures offered a form of psychological protection, shielding their people from extreme survival conditions. One could argue this was a form of societal control during extreme times. Of course, that was ancient times, and humans have long moved away from the harsh survival conditions of the past. Living in safety isn't an issue anymore, but humans continue to nurture ever-growing desires. While ordinary people once struggled on the brink of hunger, Emperor Gu Bosi of the Lushadai had 10,000 chefs under his employ. This kind of language and the luxury it conveys are no longer uncommon. When you already have abundant food and comfortable living arrangements, does that make you content? It doesn't. Most people still fall into the vicious cycle of escalating expectations, the more they gain, the more they desire. Clearly, despite humanity's material power having multiplied a thousandfold, there hasn't been a significant improvement in enhancing inner experiences. Society compels individuals to chase after more wealth, a form of misinterpretation of happiness. In modern civilization, wealth and status are prominent symbols of happiness. People believe that as long as they have money, life can undergo a transformation. Is this perception founded on logical reasoning? There's a tale of Midas Golden Touch. He prayed to the gods to become the wealthiest person, and they granted him the power to turn anything he touched into gold. He rejoiced, yet shortly thereafter, he starved to death as the food he touched also turned into gold. You see, ancient prophecy already told us that controlling external conditions won't necessarily improve one's life. More and more surveys show that once people's wealth reaches a certain level, their sense of happiness doesn't continue to increase alongside the growth in riches. This implies that societal recognition doesn't necessarily correlate with life quality. In Mihai's view, the belief that acquiring wealth leads to happiness is merely a method of societal control. It uses happiness as bait to keep people immersed. For instance, on one hand, banks shape us into citizens who work hard to earn and save money. On the other hand, businesses encourage us to spend the hard-earned money on consumption. Pursuing what society dictates you should pursue, even if you obtain those things, your satisfaction derives from others' approval. Ultimately, your spiritual life remains under societal control. So, by clarifying the boundaries between societal control and genetic control of happiness, perhaps you've discovered that only when you are the master of your consciousness can happiness be attainable.
In the complex realm of human survival, achieving certain goals involves patience, sacrifice, and compromise. However, Mihai suggests not becoming a puppet in the process, as that would only render you a tool for others' exploitation. Furthermore, don't aim for society's rewards, instead, target rewards that you can control. Regain the power to control your self-awareness. The same applies to transcending the bodily desires driven by genes. Being the master of your own consciousness means having the freedom to determine the essence of life experiences. Therefore, Mihai's first viewpoint is that only those who learn to control their consciousness can determine their own life experiences and thereby achieve happiness. The joy we derive from life ultimately depends on how our minds filter and process daily experiences. The harmony within us has no bearing on our ability to control the universe. Because we only control the external environment for survival, this doesn't reduce the chaos the world presents us. Immerse yourself in the pleasure brought about by genes, and you'll only obtain momentary happiness. Chasing after wealth goals for societal approval turns individuals into puppets of societal control. Therefore, seeking inner harmony can only begin with mastering consciousness and becoming your own master. To control consciousness, we must understand how human consciousness operates. Mihai's greatest innovation in flow theory is the utilization of the concept of entropy from physics to assess consciousness. He introduces the concept of psychic entropy to denote a state of disorder in the conscious region, which is a highlight of the entire book. Let's examine the second viewpoint. Optimal experiences can counteract psychic entropy and maintain the orderly state of consciousness. First, let's clarify what entropy is. In physics, entropy represents the degree of disorder. You might have heard of the law of conservation of energy, energy in nature doesn't decrease or increase, it only transforms. This is the first law of thermodynamics. Then there's the second law of thermodynamics, which states that heat moves from hot objects to cooler ones on its own, and energy conversion processes always result in loss. As a result, objects' concentrations tend to diffuse, structures tend to disappear, and order tends to turn into disorder. This measure of disorder is entropy, and in spontaneous physical processes, entropy constantly increases. Mihai introduced this term to describe the disordered state of consciousness and developed the concept of optimal experience to counteract this disorder. Focus can bring happiness. When you're fully immersed in an activity, a continuous stream of mental energy flows, and this is flow. So when does flow occur? Let's move on to the third viewpoint. Clear goals, timely feedback, and the balance between challenge and skill create the flow experience. You might think that the happiest moments in life are when you can relax and not think about anything. However, this isn't the case. Even though you may feel happy at such times, optimal experiences don't occur then. Optimal experiences take place when an individual invests their emotions into a challenging task, pushing physical and mental capabilities to their limits. This occurs when a person puts forth their best effort for a demanding task, fully utilizing both physical and intellectual capacities. Only during such moments does one feel capable of controlling their actions and influencing their fate. This is the state of flow. Just like swimmers breaking records or rock climbers reaching the summit, during the struggle, they don't necessarily feel pleasure, they might experience muscle soreness, exhaustion, but after the activity, they feel an immense sense of satisfaction. They might even consider those moments to be the most beautiful in their lives. These accumulated life experiences culminate into a sense of participation in deciding the meaning of life. This is what comes closest to the state of happiness that people can envision. So, when does flow occur? What specific conditions need to be met? First, let's discuss the initial condition for flow, having clear goals. Psychological experiments have shown that compared to being forced into doing something, experiencing a lack of purpose or aimlessness leads to the worst experience. In such cases, the mind tends to wander, causing negative emotions like anxiety, fear, and boredom. On the other hand, individuals with clear goals and strong self-esteem, as noted by American philosopher and psychologist William James, find their self-esteem affected by the ratio of expectations to success. If goals are set too high and success is rare, one's self-esteem remains unsatisfied, leading to a poor experience. Conversely, without goals, self-esteem won't find satisfaction either. Clearly, goals are crucial for an individual. Whether goals are proactive or reactive, 
they are always better than aimless actions. When people have clear goals, they take steps to achieve them. For instance, a mountaineer will set a goal to reach the summit, planning their equipment, route, and preparing for potential difficulties. At such times, an individual's inner state is lucid. Next, it's timely feedback. It allows individuals to know immediately after completing a step whether they've done well or not. Climbers, for instance, know with each ascent that they've progressed. Clear goals and timely feedback go hand in hand, without clear and straightforward goals, there can't be feedback since you don't know if you've achieved them. Many people struggle to stick to their goals because their objectives are vague and uncertain. Take fitness, for example. Setting goals like, give it your best, is unclear. Your brain needs to keep pondering whether you're giving your best effort, making it difficult to engage. However, setting goals like, do 12 reps per set with a 30 second rest, and if you can't manage, then stop, is a clear and feedback friendly objective. Timely feedback ensures you're not lost but fully aware of your actions. Apart from clear goals and timely feedback, another condition aiding the flow state is matching the challenge's difficulty with one's skill level. Doing low challenge tasks with high skill is boring, while high challenge tasks with low skill cause anxiety. When a task results in either boredom or anxiety, how could you persevere? However, between anxiety and boredom lies a magical space, where individuals easily enter a state of focus, this is flow. To be precise, when the difficulty slightly exceeds skill by 5% to 10%, flow is most likely to occur. Even someone exerting themselves to reach a mountaintop finds equilibrium between challenge and skill. With clear goals, prompt feedback, and a balance between challenge and ability, the three conditions for creating flow are met. Attention gathers, and gradually, individuals enter a flow state, focused on their task without distraction. At this point, unity of mind and body is achieved. Irrelevant thoughts and emotions vanish, and even the self disappears, though the sensations are heightened compared to usual. The past two hours feel like just two minutes. Whatever you do gains immense value because the action itself becomes the purpose. This ultimate experience is like a magnet drawing you to demonstrate advanced skills, willingly embracing challenges. So, why is it challenging for people nowadays to experience flow? It's as though the pure joy of being engrossed in a single thing has vanished. Creating a flow channel requires substantial effort, and people prefer passive enjoyment by consuming readily available movie plots and entertainment shows rather than utilizing their attention for more demanding, yet more rewarding, flow experiences. Alright, this concludes our third viewpoint, clear goals, timely feedback, and the balance between challenge and skill create the flow experience. And that concludes this issue. Let's review the key points from the book, Flow, by Mihai Csikszentmihalyi. In this book, Mihai explores when humans are happiest. Firstly, Mihai believes that only those who learn to master their consciousness can determine their life experience and achieve a state of happiness. The joy we derive from life ultimately depends on how our minds filter and interpret daily experiences. The harmony within ourselves has no correlation with our ability to control the universe. This is because our external environment is controlled solely for survival, which doesn't reduce the chaos that the world brings us. Immersing ourselves in the pleasures dictated by our genes only brings temporary happiness, and chasing societal recognition through wealth goals makes us puppets of societal control. Therefore, the pursuit of inner harmony can only start by gaining control of our consciousness and becoming our own masters. Secondly, the ability to counteract psychic entropy is the key to optimal experience, maintaining an orderly consciousness. The complex human consciousness system requires order, as disorderly states create discomfort. Allowing mental disorder to persist can cause significant harm to the self, rendering individuals unable to focus on any goals and leading to a lackluster experience. Mihai coined the term, psychic entropy, to describe the disordered state of consciousness. He also developed the concept of optimal experience to counteract this disorder. Focus can lead to happiness, when fully engaged in an activity, mental energy continuously flows, resulting in the state of flow. When does flow occur? Mihai discovered that clear goals and the timely feedback of challenge and skill matching lead to the experience of flow. If you want to create more flow experiences, you must find a way to align what you're doing with these conditions. Alright, this sharing ends here.
If you're interested in learning how to achieve flow experiences, you can continue listening to the other two books in this series, Exploring Flow and Creativity. Congratulations, you've completed another book. Thank you for your support and attention. Please subscribe to the Tim Booker channel, like, and share with your family and friends. Wisdom deserves to be spread. Let's embark on a brighter future. Thank you, and goodbye.